perhaps the most faff duplicity thing to ever happen was when Quentin de Kock and David Warner were about to fight in a Durban stairwell, and faff turned up to stop it wearing only a towel. Of all the great stories of other people taking on the Australians, no player has ever taken them on, you know, pretty much naked. It is because of that that when you pitch a Faf Duplessy, you might think of him topless. Or it is because you have seen him like this, you know, a lot. In fact, we've seen him almost as much with his shirt on as without it on. But when I pitch a Faf, it is how I first saw him. Batting at number five, not making any runs, and bowling leg spin. And that was for Lancashire. And the commentators kept talking up what was an impressive cricketer. But year after year, I would watch him in county cricket, and he wouldn't do much well other than field. His batting was really ordinary, and his bowling was absolutely dog shit. And I couldn't even work out how he was getting a game, let alone any attention. However, after five years of his T20 career, he was averaging mean with the bat and a strike rate of 117. And he would bowl two overs a game where he managed somehow a bowling average of 16 and an economy of seven. He was definitely a better bowl than a batter at that point. And not for a little time, his professional career started in 2004, meaning that almost eight years in, he was better with the ball than with the bat in T20 cricket. That isn't quite true, because his bowling numbers definitely flatter him. My memory was that he was not an incredible leggy, that he was terrible. In fact, to prove that, let me show you how his bowling stats have gone over the years. In 2013, he didn't bowl at all. Then after 2014, he never bowled again in T20 cricket. I think even he understood at that point that he wasn't a good bowler. But in 2012, he definitely wasn't a good T20 batter. And that is a crucial year because that is when he actually gets picked in the IPL. And I looked at all the normal things, like if he'd made any runs against India and in T20Is, or if he'd made even a great knock against him in ODI cricket. He really hadn't made any runs against India that had pointed to him actually doing quite well in the IPL. So the next thing I checked was the 2011 World Cup because I assumed that maybe he had made runs in India. But again, he hadn't really done much there either. So I would assume that it was the CSK Brain Trust looking for a quality role player. Faf may not have been a top 20 player at this point, or even a competent one, but he's very well known and respected around the circuit, and he could bat, bowl, and field at this point, and they probably thought he was a good guy to have around. But this is fun. This is all the players in my database with over 35 innings batting in the top five from the start of 2007 until the end of 2011. And here is Faf with the worst average of any of them. And he really didn't do that much better with his strike rate. He's not dead last year because there were some comical early strike rates at the beginning of T20. But there also wasn't any point where his speed was that good. The point is that when Faf Duplessis was hired by the Chennai Super Kings, he was one of the worst T20 players in the world. And now, more than a decade later, this is not a stat that means all that much, but it shows that he's scored a lot of runs per knock when he has played in the IPL. In fact, he's been incredibly consistent run scorer in that league, and that alone is a great skill. And when you look at his overall record, he has an average under 30 in a calendar year in T20 since the start of 2017. Since 2017. And his numbers aren't just beating 30. Only one year he was under 35 in that period. It took him a while to work out T20 scoring, but once he did, he went all supernova with it. This shows he is now one of the better run scorers in T20 cricket. He's still nowhere near the level of Devon Conway and the two Pakistani openers, but what he has done is turned himself into a very reliable anchor that can basically play in any conditions in the world. Last year, he played 50 T20 matches, his most by a long margin, and he played them all around the T20 world. So these numbers are from volume, and it is clear that he has learned how to score no matter what the conditions or league. That is a huge change from when he couldn't even score hugely in South Africa when he was a developing player. There is another thing that has changed a little bit in his batting since those early days. Back then, he was a middle order, like he is in ODIs and Red Bull cricket. But Faf as a 2020 player doesn't make much sense in the middle order because he can score against spin, but incredibly slowly. He can certainly not punish it. He should have always been at the top. And that change has unleashed his main skills against pace. And so now, despite not really being thought of as a T20 specialist, he has the 20th most runs in the history of T20. He is only a thousand less than people like Josh Butler, A.B. De Villiers, and David Miller, which shows you just how much he has caught up to those kinds of players. And if you look at the dudes with 8,000 runs, despite his slow start, he scores 28 runs per innings. That is more than Dawid Milan and just behind Alex Hales. These are guys who are known as T20 players. If you look at his golden period, he has the 12th most runs per innings in this time. This shows that opening is good for pretty much all players, but certainly for Faf. But he has also become very good at it. 
but scoring runs is only part of the job. The next part is how fast you do them. And he has got quicker, not fast fast, but since the start of 2017, he's only had one year with a strike rate under 130, and even that was 129. But last year he was at 142, and that was on the highest volume of cricket he has played. And this year he started off over 150. And while that number probably won't stay, it would be hard to look at him right now and feel like he is not attacking more than he ever has. Kartikeya has a piece on attacking shots that happens to feature Faf in it. And so this year, he is scoring almost two runs a ball on his attacking shots. The players who get to that mark are usually great hitters. And we don't have his numbers for this going through his entire career, but we know what we see, right? And if you just look at his IPL work with true strike rate, which is my contextual measure to have a look at how fast or slow you score for the actual balls that you're facing in that innings, he started off very aggressive, but quite quickly in the IPL, he becomes a par scorer until the last two years when his team's got a small bump. And I did wonder when looking at all this, if he had upped himself against spin, but you can see that it's his record against pace that still sticks out. And this year he's scoring off the quicks, like he's, I don't know, batting at the death or something. I don't think he'll ever be a hitter because I think he gets stuck too much in many innings. And I don't think he'll ever not think about himself as a batter, but maybe he can. Because if you go through his career, he was an ineffectual middle order player, a low impact top order guy, and now he is one of the most consistent scorers that T20 cricket has ever had. It is possible now that he's thinking he could actually flirt with being a high impact opener as well. Because why wouldn't he think that? Now, perhaps his play against Ben will always hold that back. But Faf has always been two things, incredibly fit and a thorough professional. Someone who works on his game incredibly hard. He's never going to go down as a great player in any of the formats or even in the IPL. But he is someone who has pushed himself to find the best ways to help his team. It was leg spin and fielding once upon a time, and now it's slogging fast bowlers at the top. The thing is with Faf that there is no one way to remember him. It could be as an alpha male or the world's best fielder or a test player who could bat out draws or the man who was sledged by a 12th man in a World Cup or a captain who got the most out of his test team or an actor in A.B. De Villiers' music video. Or, I don't know, or if you have recency bias, it'll be as an anchor in the IPL. But the truth is that when you can do all these things, you're always providing value to your team. Fafty Plus is probably never going to be the most valuable player, but he has worked his entire career to just continually add value. And even at the age of 38, he's still doing it.